Yeah, I'm, I'm Matt from <laughs> Matt from Waterpro. Um, Jeff's just asked me to come past this morning. Um, said you guys are all malnourished, um, so I'd give you a bit of food and uh, give you some irrigation training. Basically, I guess with the wetland projects that you guys are working on at the moment, there's obviously, I guess, a vast difference in the type of valves that are being installed, um, being drip lines, sprinkler systems, um, master valves, flow sensors, all this sort of stuff. And I guess there's not a lot of, um, I guess, information on the plans that I guess show you guys exactly how that actually is to go in. So part of that today is just to give you guys a, I guess, a brief rundown as to how, how we expect these to go into the ground. Um, and then obviously moving forward, that just keeps standards for you guys to be able to put the same sort of thing in every time. So when you're seeing them in the ground, you understand looking at something like this in the box, that that means that that's for a drip valve. All right, so I guess the first off is uh, this this system here is what we call our, our micro drip um, system, is our valve system for this. Um, coming out of the main line, which would have the, the blue line uh, coming up into here, we have our ball valve, which is our isolation valve. This allows us obviously to turn that, isolate that water so we can, if we had to ever do work here, we don't have to turn the rest of the system off, all right? We go into our Hunter ICV or a solenoid valve that's been specified depending on the job. Most of these, I think, Jeff, are all ICVs, the whole job is. Um, lilac flow handle, just to indicate that it, we're using recycled water. Um, it's just, I guess, a, a statutory requirement for the government and for the, um, the developers here that have asked for that. When you're installing these, um, it's just a handy thing to know is anti-clockwise, all right? Just leave them anti-clockwise until they won't go any further. Don't have to tighten them way too far, but just, just enough that basically means it's fully open. Reason being is if they're wound all the way down, it's like a tap. So if these are wound all the way down, they're only gonna allow a really little amount of water out. So you're gonna find that that's gonna be a problem when you start turning all your garden beds on. So have this all the way open and you'll be fine, all right? This is your solenoid, the coil. General rule for all solenoids that you'll see in Australia, uh, your coil is downstream, meaning it's uh, like that's the, the flow direction. So something to just always remember is obviously there is flow arrows on the valves, little arrows on top here that tell you which way, but as a general rule, the coil is normally at the downstream side as well. Basically, you go from the solenoid valve for a drip system into your filter. All right, now your filter is basically a series, it's just a screen. Some have discs. Um, in this project, we've just gone with a screen. This is just a mesh. It just basically stops. Um, if being recycled systems, we don't know what's exactly coming through that network. Um, as you can see on your drip tubes, you've got nice small little holes on there. We don't need that clogging up, and all of a sudden, you've got a lot of money in plants and all that sort of stuff. And if that clogs up, then you're gonna have plant loss. So it's just a flow on effect from basically simply putting in a filter, we can make sure that this is working for years to come as well. So that comes in on the system. All right. What's the maintenance time on, like, obviously, uh, for these? Just to check those um, like in like a wetland situation, like Look, a big system would it be like a six months, 12 months? Yeah, it's about a 12 month situation, six yeah. Seconds. Yeah, if it was, if you knew your water was really dirty, like, you know, I guess you were pumping from the wetland or the Murray River, just straight into your irrigation, yeah, maybe every month, because it would clog up yeah. really quick, because there's a lot of algae and things like that coming in, but you've seen the water coming out of these meters, they look quite clear, they're not, it's not too bad, it's just, it will have micro debris in there, you just can't see it when it's flowing, so, but yeah, normally so yearly. Yep. I mean, that was probably one of the other things we're going to check on. Such a huge problem there. Yep. And, um, I mean, it would have been a big job to do all the stations. Oh, it's a, it's a process for this um, to, to go through and look at all of these. Um, the, I guess the maintenance on these is at least you know where your valve boxes are on a plan um, as a maintenance point. So you can go to that, lift the valve box, flush that out, see that the filter's okay, chuck it back in and are good to go. Whereas the repair to fix, you know, block drippers and stuff like that from not having it, yet where do you go? Where do you find yeah. that? Where you've lost plants? I guess this is an easier. It's just harder that you've got to. Well, I, mean, I guess yeah, yeah you've got to do it every year. Setup, if you're doing a 
do the process right. Good setup, yep. and you know, you know, it's in place for something like so. Yeah. You don't know what's going on. Something's up before it made it a lot harder. Though. Well, that's right, and and all of what you guys are installing is eventually going to become handed down for here is to the city of Port Adelaide Enfield. So they're then going to be left with what you guys have installed and so this should have a 20 to 25 year minimum lifespan on it that they can come back in and if the filters ever get damaged we can just basically buy that screen as a replacement and the rest of the housing's all polyethylene so it's fine so it's going to stay providing it hasn't cracked or what have you it should still be fine to use all right uh, moving from the filter we then go into our pressure reducer all right, now well, because we're working with micro drip tube, right? Where and we've got low density fittings with the clips, um, the poly clips here, isn't it, Jeff? Yep. Um, we're wanting to make sure that that pressure in the network's not building up, because obviously once we fill the lines with water, these are only going to be get, delivering one, each dripper is going to be delivering 1.6 liters an hour. So there's not a lot of water coming out of each one. So there's going to be this pressure build up back in the line. When there's too much pressure build up, the first thing that happens is you, and you guys have no doubt have seen it, is you know you, you turn a valve on and your uh, fittings will just like the elbows or the T's will just go bang and pop out. That's because these may not have been in. All right, so this reduces the pressure, just protects the system. It's enough pressure to turn the drippers on, but not enough pressure to blow the fittings apart, basically. And that's as simple as that. It's just to protect the system. And, and keep it going for a long, longer. How so, in here, drippers. How do like you put them in the uh, drip line? Uh, it's a it's on a machine process basically. So when they they've got a, uh, it almost looks like making spaghetti. To be yeah. honest, like it's melted plastic, yeah. um, and they've got all the drippers. And as they're pushing it through like a tube, there's like a, a basically a, a solid piece of pipe that the like almost like making sausages. You see the the actual um, pipe running across and in every set amount of time so the 0.3 or 0.4 of a meter yeah. um, they glue the actual dripper in underneath and then there's a laser drill hole that drills as part of that process as it's going along and just drills it all the way through so um, yeah and uh, from what I've seen I haven't seen too many that don't drip yeah. they, they're pretty accurate with it which is pretty cool so um, these are the drippers come from overseas, but it's all this stuff's all manufactured here in Australia, which is pretty cool as well. Uh, in Perth and Melbourne, so yeah, so Perth for the Metafim stuff. It is. Is they have a fa factory in Perth doing it as well? I thought, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. So, but I know the drippers come from like Israel or something as well. So, yep. Um, after the drip, the pressure reducer, we then go into our. Um, nut and tail here, or a director into the poly pipe. All of what you guys are using here is all 25 mil poly pipe. We've done it that way from a design point of view, so we're not having to install bigger pipes after the valve and then doing smaller lots. It's just easier to have banks of valves with only 50, the 25 mil low density. As you guys would know, it's a bit easier to roll out and lay down and pin it in the ground and then cover it with mulch and go that way. So. The only thing that would be different on this installation is here, you can see that green O-ring, means this, this here doesn't actually need thread tape. So because you're sealing against that O-ring there, against that face, you don't need an actual thread tape there. You'll need thread tape into all of the other parts, just not in that bit there. That's all that you need to be aware of, all right? Reason being is if you've got thread tape here, it'll open that thread size up, which may flare this and crack it eventually if you've got that seal so yeah <laughs> um it's just it's just longevity so see you, mate um yeah so basically uh one thing i've also done here and this is just something because we've got a bit of length here and we're trying to fit this inside of our box um it's handy to be aware when you're installing your ball valves that you've given yourself enough room to be able to work with what you're doing. So try not have your ball valve, everything set all the way hard up against the valve box or all the way the other end, because you think if this is hard up against the valve box, how am I gonna unscrew that? And you gotta think about that for the next people that are gonna have to come in and work with it for you. So um, I know it might be a pain to maybe reset a valve box, but um, if council come along and they see them, they a lot of the time they'll tend to say, nah, dig it up 
and do it all again. Whereas if you already had it there, you could have just done it at the time. So what I tend to do is I'll have an isolation valve because 90% of the time these are on. So I'll have my isolation valve up, unless you've got enough room, but because I can't have that valve turning into the box, I don't want it hitting that valve box. So what I'll have is that up like that, and then when we're down, we're just next to the solenoid valve. And it's on, it's nice and neat, there's no issues there. All right, this is something just to think about when you're threading it up, is just to have it nice and easy, just from a maintenance point of view as well. All right, um, from a drip valve, does that make sense for everyone from the drip valve? Any other questions regarding that? That's all good, you'll see that for basically all your garden bed valves. All right, so, and your subsurface valves that you know when you're doing your drip tube under lawns it's the same process whether you're doing it for garden bed or for lawn um, we've standardized now using the the Netafim XR which has copper um, built into the actual dripper which stops the roots wanting to grow into the holes and blocking those tubes the copper stops that happening so we've just standardized and went oh, we'll do that in for you guys you've got one type of tube to use and that just means that you can use it for garden bed and for lawn and so you don't you're not going to mistake one product for the other. All right. Um, the next one would be not much different from that. Is your sprinkler valves now? Your sprinkler valves for doing say these MP rotator bodies and stuff like that that you've got here when you're putting them in your verges or your small lawn areas and stuff. Same process with the bull valve, bull valve upright like that. Um, obviously, you're going to have more room here, so you could have it upright with the bull valve hand going the other way. But I like to think you just have everything doing the same way, nice and upright, nice and clean. Thread tape on here, and we go into the outlet of our solenoid valve, and then we can go straight onto our poly pipe. Now, um, when you're doing that, that then goes to your 25 mil poly and then out to your sprinklers. You've got a, Yeah, so PVC, exactly the same thing. The difference being is this here is going to be, still have thread tape on it, but it's going to be a valve socket. So it's just going to be a female socket going into 25 or 40 mil PVC. Um, and then we, we glue from that, but we don't glue into the thread. We still use thread tape, all right? Um, the only other thing, I think there's a few here with the AccuSynchs. You've got these there as well, is this is effectively your pressure reducer. That's the same process there. What this is doing is instead of it being downstream like that, it's actually regulating it on the valve. So we take the coil off. Now remember, do this when the water's off, so isolated. Because when you do that with a valve, I don't know if you've been aware of that, the valve's on now. So water will be coming out and down the line as well. So this goes on, all right? We push that on like that. And then on the top, there's a collar, which we do up. All right, and as we're doing that up, it's tightening up on the actual valve stem. All right, so we do that. Then we screw our coil back on top. All right, now some of these you'll see specced into the, pro into the projects. Reason being is what we're trying to do is pressure. This might be on a master valve at the start of the system. So we're saying, all right, we're just gonna protect everything downstream that we don't want to blow up anything downstream we just want to look after it so we put one of these on or sprinklers valves we don't want to these restrict flow a little bit this won't because obviously as you can see we haven't changed the outlet here what we're doing is reducing the pressure that's directly acting against that valve so and then here we got an actual adjustment so we can actually set the pressure that we want with these as well so, and we'll have on the, on the drawings, we'll have what valve pressures we want it to be set at. It'll say, you know, say valve 15 is this many liters a minute at whatever pressure. And we'd set that and you'd wind that to say 30 where the white line is and you'd wind it to 30 and you'd be good to go. So you can see if I pass it around, you can see you can actually just wind that up and down and you can adjust that pressure. All right. Um, nothing really changes in solenoid valves from there. I think that's pretty well, I guess, the most of it. When you're going up to 40 mil, 50 mil valves, the process doesn't change, it's the same thing. It's just being really aware that obviously as you get bigger in the valve, your space in the valve box is smaller. So you don't have as much room to play with it. As you can see how small that is, with a 25 mil bull valve in, a, in one of your big boxes, you've got plenty of room to sort of move. Whereas if you then go back to a 50 mil valve, well now you've now you're really restricted. So we need to think about making sure it's nice and central 
when you're setting that valve box slab, that concrete slab underneath, that you've got nice height there and it's nice and central and then you can start back filling your valve box up as well. All right. Um, back onto the drip valves, you guys have probably seen these installed in a square purple top valve box in your lawns, your garden beds, all that sort of stuff. This is a flushing valve, okay? Um, there's two options in the market available. This is what we call a manual flushing valve. It's just a basically a little ball valve that, that is built for 25 mil poly pipe. Um, other options are automatic ones. So when the system turns on, the pressure's low, it'll purge water out until it, the pressure starts to build up and then it will seal. I tend to not spec those into the jobs because they're, from when I used to do maintenance work on sites, they were the first things that would fail. So when you had a leak in the system, you'd go to the end of the line and you'd sure enough, there'd be something stuck in that unit and it was just weeping the whole time. Whereas at least this is physically closed and it's part of that when we we're talking about doing the filter, the filter maintenance and having a look at the filters. We turn those valves on and we come back out and we just open the valve up. When it's in line, it's on and water will start coming out. And what that's doing is just flushing the lines in case any dirt did get into this line or when we were installing the systems. So this is a good process for when you guys have actually laid all the system out. You've installed everything down, you put this in. Turn this on. Leave this on and let water run out of it. And it just flushes because you guys are in pretty dirty, dusty rocks, all this sort of stuff environments. And there's no, there's a high chance that rocks and stuff have got inside your pipe, right? And dirt and whatever, just from dragging it around in the site. So this will just flush that out and stop it from blocking any of your drippers. Once you're happy with it and it's flowing nicely and all that, all right, then we can just um, seal that off and then now the pressure will start to build up and water will come out your drippers. All right? That gets housed poly pipe on, on one side. Make sure we clip that and then inside of our box, nice and set, nice and flat, ready to go. All right? Simple as that. Just with these, um, with everything system that we use here, you've got to make sure they're clean and tidy. Because if you throw this on the ground, it gets dirt stuck in there. So because the flow goes this way at the moment, if you throw it on the ground, dirt gets in there. There's a diaphragm in here. And it goes in that diaphragm mm -hmm. and it wedges that diaphragm and it always got a consistent amount of water and you can't shut it off. Yep. You're going to pull this apart, right? And you're going to take, take the rock out of it or the dirt out of it. And that's why, that's why we say to you, don't throw them on the ground. Same with the sprinklers. You guys throw the sprinklers on the ground, get sand in it. And that's why the sprinklers heads pop up and the spray is not that good because you just throw dirt in the sprinklers. So they stop and you yep. build these and the sprinklers and everything to make sure they're all clean and tidy to flush yep. them out. That's why we flush them out because they're a pain in the ass to change these over once they're in the valve boxes installed. Yep. You can set you can set them up on an elbow, just pointing upwards, and that's fine as well. That just keeps basically dirt from sitting like yeah. silt and whatever building up. Um, but in regards to the solenoid valves, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically what Jeff was saying there is you've got a rubber seat that seals down on, on top of it, which closes it off. When there's a rock in there, obviously it can't close down, so it's stuck, which means the first thing it's gonna do is this goes, well, I can't, can't close, I'll just stay open. Um, and heaps of commercial projects will see it, but it's just a case of being really aware of like, if you've got tubs or in your utes or whatever, the valve boxes don't, those valves don't go in the ground or they're sat on a nice clean area, ready to be installed. And then you're working in a clean environment um, because it's just the headaches afterwards of having to come out and undrill all that and hope that it all goes back in the right way. There's springs and there's, there's like a needle in there and all sorts of stuff. Like it's, it's not overly difficult to do it, but if we can avoid it, then we don't have to do it and we can move on to the next valve. Same when you're your pipes up as well. I see some of you guys, when you get your pipes in the ground, you're, you're sliding it forward and dirt's going into that line. You're gluing it up and then you slide the next pipe down and you're gluing it up. All that line gets dirt in it. And when, you spring, when your spring line comes up, They'll come up and they'll get blocked. And then you wonder why they're not working because all your dirt's gone in that line because you're not lifting your pipe up, blowing it, and then, then placing it in the ground. So That's don't right. slide them along the ground as well. Yep. And it's just, and even, even from sliding them on the long, or like dragging them along the concrete as well is something to think about because you, when you're dragging your pipe along the concrete, you, sh you start shaving that pipe off on the edge and you could potentially be doing damage to the pipe. You haven't noticed it, you've buried it and all of a sudden it's, it's a weak spot and it's cracked. Now you gotta go back and dig it all up and you gotta leak. Um, and like, like Jeff's saying there, we, we don't wanna, we know we can flush, but we don't wanna be flushing a pipe that's full of dirt. We'd rather have it, that we, could, we still know we have to flush regardless, but 
if it's clean, yeah, wicked, we did a great job. We don't have to have it on for 20 minutes flushing all this mud out of the lines. Because the reality is, is you can have it on for 20 minutes with a lot of water and it's still got mud coming out if you've just got that much dirt in it. So just, just taking care while you're installing, um, just goes a long way, all right? Um, next part of your drip systems and your, for your garden beds and your lawns in the drip is your flushing valve, oh, so your air release valves, all right? Now these go, normally, you've been installing them straight after the valve? No, well, end of the lines. End of the lines, yep, cool. Um, so general rule is either end, yeah, start of the line, end of a line, so you at least know where they're gonna be, or some people will, in, a, in certain situations will try and pick them at the highest point if it was a really undulating area. I mean, most of this has been graded, so your valves are coming out on a certain level. Um, what this is doing is stopping that suction on vacuuming effect in the pipe. So when you turn the valve off, these are all obviously outlets. So what's gonna happen is they're gonna to wanna to suck back in and, and cause this vacuuming effect and crush the pipe back in, like a, you know, like almost like a space saver bag. You see them, you know, like cr crushing back in. What this does is when, when the system's on, this is up because there's pressure, water pressure underneath this and it's sealing. When we turn the system off, the pressure releases, this pops back down. When that pops back down, air can get back into the line. And that's all good. What that does is it stops, it stops the actual, um, I guess, dirt wanting to get sucked back into the drip tube. It's just prolonging that system. I mean, there's a lot of money in drip tube and, and all the systems you guys are putting in for a small couple of little things that just protect it. And again, hand it over to council that they know they're going to get a system that lasts for 20, 25 years. All right. Um, Obviously, poly pipe either side, either on T's or elbows. There'll be some options where you've put these on elbows as well, and that's fine. Um, we put the poly pipe on, we clip it, and on here, we put a little bit of thread tape. Not a lot, just maybe go around twice just to seal it, and then we do that up. All right, now we don't have to do that all the way because we don't want to crack it. We just want to feel that that's nice and tight. And it normally, not, not just past hand height is probably more than enough, and then that's not going to seal. It'll be fine. All right. Um, Yeah, in an ideal situation, it should go at the highest point, obviously, because air's going to want to, as far as bubbles and stuff, it's going to want to come to the top. So where, where possible we do that, realistically, sometimes in commercial situations, that's not that easy. Um, the highest point might be right next to a footpath and things like that, where we don't really want this getting driven over by a car that might do a U-turn and just drive over a valve box and things like that. So um, we, we do it where it's practical, um, is there a standard how far away from the valve box it has to be? Or? Nah, not really. It's, yeah. it's more, um, I've, I've, I've installed these in systems where instead of this, I've actually threaded, put a threaded fitting on and I've had it sh literally there and then gone out to the system because I've had enough room yeah. um, because it was quite high and it was going down. So I was like, well, air's going to push out here anyway yeah. and it's fine and we can keep it all in the one valve box, yeah. um, which is something that still can be done. It's just, it's handy when you're pushing it out with water that you've got it at the end of the line because then obviously the air's getting pushed as well. So, um, I mean, if, if Jeff, you're standardising on end of the lines ideally, that works fine. Um, the beauty of this product is it's also anti-siphon. So it's got a, what they call a little valve in it that stops, supposedly stops the air coming in, which they say makes this redundant. Um, we put them in anyway because I can tell what's happening here. I can't tell if it's actually happening when it's buried in the ground and I can't see it. So it's just a little bit of insurance that we put on the system, just to be sure. All right. Yep. Yeah, and just knowing that you've... Yeah. Yep. 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 Just with the installs and stuff, I mean, is there, is the person who's doing that siding, I just know that, like, that was so how heavy the situation was with uh, all those valve boxes, nothing was marked, and like, yeah, had a, you know, it wasn't, it was rain that system, but 
careful, unlicensed to the computer and all this shit, but the fault finding was just so hard because you had so many valve boxes to go to and you didn't know, the only way of turning it, you, know, you had to go and turn it on is down the bowels of the hospital. Yeah, but on the plans, that is the man, the boys, yeah. they, when we get the plans, they're all marked out. And each station, yeah. it's got number one to it, so we know yeah. what the colour code of basically where your garden beds are going right, and where it is. But the difference is, they're going off a plan, and yeah. when we're out there and we've got walls and different situations, as long as we know we're roughly, okay, so I'll have it put this in this garden bed, I'll put it over there, I'll show Matt, tell Matt, and when it goes, when he redoes it to go to council, they're all colour coded and they're all yep. stations. Yeah, uh, I, just, I understand. I know we'll probably go into the coding bit of it, but I mean, just from a valve box, like even if it was just a manual date it was installed, even or whatever, and you could just initial it, but you can put things like, oh yeah, rain garden or end of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can do that. Is here or wherever, just, yep. just those little things that you can load on the lid. We go to yeah. golf courses and stuff like that. Yep. Actually, we turn it upside down to get number one. Yep. Right yeah. Garden. Number two. Get, there's no problem doing it when you're installing that. No, yep. I mean, it was. That we've, was we've, that hadn't been done. That we were actually, you know, there was a hell of a lot of money to do it and just sort of to work all that shit out before yep. we even fix anything. And like, um, obviously, I just mean we're doing installs, get it right then. And, make it easier down the line it's because it's, it's yeah. big money to just walk around and try and work that shit out later and if you're if you're putting a let's say this was valve 12 you're putting in right and you knew where it was on the plan and and, and things change on the plan from plans to what's actually happening on site but you knew this was going to be valve 12. what i what i used to do was basically well, after i installed this i hadn't wired anything up yet but i knew this was going to be valve 12. i'd either have a, a piece of duct tape that you'd have folded over right and with texture i'd write 12 on it all right, on both sides, and then I just knew that, that was 12 when I was opening up the valve boxes and I'm wiring things up, that it's going to be 12 on the thing. So then I knew when you're running, this is going back now onto like the wiring up side of things, when we're picking our colours, obviously with the cable that's coming through and we knew we had green, you, you could have a piece of paper with you and you knew your okay, cable well, valve 12, I've wired up and that's green off of that wire loop, right? And you could write that down. The beauty of doing that is you've got it's so much easier when you get to that controller and you're just going, cool, one was red, yep, cool, no worries. And you've got that red cable coming in, you put that into number one, away you go. And you knew where that is on the plan. It's just, it's gonna make a, a flow on effect so much easier for everyone as well. So other jobs that we see uh, coming out and at the moment is like Jeff was saying, is there's plates underneath now um, and or on top of valve boxes where like you can get them engraved and it'll actually tell you what the valves are. Um, golf courses tend to do that more because they've got oh, Tea Tree Gully Golf Course has got 500 and um, 500 of something of them so yeah it's a lot so um, it, there's a lot of uh, you got six six uh, valve boxes in a row what's what's doing what you know what I mean yeah. so and then and that's that's where you're sort of yeah, saying I mean, you know I, you could, I know you Yeah. Rather than go back to somewhere and have someone here and there on yep. phones or whatever you're doing, like yep. where you can just manually turn something on and yep. yeah, so it's all yeah, it for sure. Just... Yeah. Um, I guess other than that, um, the only other thing I was probably going to say was when you guys are doing everything from a control point of view, um, which is AC, meaning it's it's a controller on a wall. When you're wiring up, you see these are both red, all right? That indicates that it's an AC coil, all right? Other valves might be black and white and they're both the same though. That still indicates an AC coil. It means, what it means is because it's an alternating current, it doesn't matter which way you have the wires, all right? When you're doing Hunter nodes, battery stuff that you might've done, you'll see that they're black and red, which means they're, they, they're, they need to be, they have to follow polarity which is basically positive and negative. So you have to put red to red and black to black, otherwise the systems just will not work. With these, it doesn't matter, all right? So you can have whatever color going to whatever wire here, and then the other wire can go to the common, all right? Um, do you guys standardize black as your common? Yeah. So you'll have, when you've got your wires going out, let's uh, say 13 cores of cable and a single core, you'll have that black, thick cable that's in the trench, 
and that's your that's your single that's your common all right so that's basically what they call the return line which just creates that electrical circuit so we would we would wire one of the cables to the black and then that black would then con would wire into here and then continue as well back out down the line as we then as we're talking about before if we said this was valve 12 and we had green available we would go all right cool number 12 is going to be green i'll grab the green cable and i'll wire that to this one all right that's done and then we move on to the next the next side of things and again it doesn't matter which way we do this um yeah only when you're doing obviously multiple cable runs like and you've got say two runs of 13 core going down a trench it's just it's handy to know which one is which sometimes what i tend to do is i'll put duct tape in the valve boxes and i know that that might have been the second wire loom so that one's actually not doing this area that that cable's going to go off and go around somewhere else it's just little things like that that are just handy to remember so yeah because then you open the valve box and you're like i don't know which one i'm going to cut is this this is going to cause problems here and i've cut green but it was actually green for the other side not for this job or something so yeah Sometimes when you try and put the valve box and the wires cross over, and you don't know, so we make sure that the wiring link comes in, you put in, and then back out again so you know where to cut, and which side to cut on, yep. all that sort of stuff as well. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you guys wanted to ask as far as that goes? Like, um, anything you can think of, Jeff? This is the questions. I, I, won't, I won't go into decoders today. I mean, I'm happy to, when you guys get to a decoder, installation point of view that you want i'm happy to come back out and uh, physically set up a decoder at a controller for everyone and, and show you how to plug them in and, and set them up um, i guess all i will say though is with the decoders is these are this is your decoder by the way um, all your wetland other than wetland a all your wetland jobs are going to be under a decoder the difference being is there's only going to be two cables a one one two cable wire path basically going out to the site whereas you traditionally you were having 13 cores nine cores seven cores all that what happens is these are basically like a mobile phone in a sense they they've got an address to them or a phone number to them that we then program in the controller so when we turn station one on we've said station one has this number to it which is like a phone number address when that signal gets sent down the line the only one that can answer is going to be the one with that that number ad address to it so it's going to go all right cool it's like a basically a password almost and it goes yeah cool that's the only one that's matched that that signal let's turn that one on and that's how that yeah, simply yeah, works that way if you, that information you don't need to have stuff written on the box because you just go no, no that's right but if down the track if something that the information is not given to you or you have this yeah and we still document it in the drawings yeah yeah one. In, the, in the control box, we do write down station one, it's garden bed one, yeah. northeastern side. If you look in the controls over there, they have good, we do write them down so they know where they're going. So yep. if Simo rocks up and goes, okay, I'm going to put station 13 on, he knows it's the southwest corner. Yep. Or he yeah. knows, and it's a garden bed or lawn area. Yep. That's what's good about, as I said, being here, like, I mean, things are getting done properly, and like, just like you said, like, making sure it's on a pad, making sure it's at the right, right yep. easy access to work to this, this, this. Yeah, for sure. Because when it's not, I just know what it's like when you just, it's, you know, stuff's underwater, it's all sunk, you know, yep. it's just, it was out of such a huge amount of money that's been spent, and something yep. like that, it was mind blowing, it, yeah. it, it stops you from doing any other work. And it's a key, it's a key thing for all you guys to be across, against, I guess, as a team, understanding exactly how everything goes in and you're all got the same standards, because then if any one of you and I don't know from the roles that Jeff's given you guys, but if any one of you, I guess, are sick for a day, so the next person can come in and pick up where it was left off and you've got the same standards, you're all installing it the same way, nothing changes. You just know where exactly where everyone's at and away you go. Um, it just makes things so much more streamlined and you guys are gonna get, you'll get through the jobs quicker too. When we're doing these, just on these decoders though, is, and I don't know if I've gone through this with you either, Jeff, but these don't get installed on site until they've been programmed. So we need to program every single decoder for the job at the controller and then take them back out and wire them up. Because as I was saying, these, are not, these aren't programmed. They've got an address on them, but they haven't been told what, what station's that for, because that can go anywhere. So you have to go to the program and go, oh, this decoder, 
I'm going to plug that in and I'll show you guys another time how to do that. But we plug it in and we assign this one to station one. So what I tend to do on here is on the actual, on the box, I'll write one. And then on the actual decoder, I'll write one. There's a spot on the decoders which is clear enough with the texture and I'll write one. I put that back in the box. And you got the plan. I just spend an hour in, at the controller and I, I program all my decoders up and then they're all in a box. Then you can go back out and you've got all these basically written up, ready to go. Because if you go and, which I've seen before, these get installed on a job and they've all been wired up, then you need to have this unit and you are physically got to go out there and plug them up and then wire them up. Like actually program them remotely like with a wireless unit. It's just a pain. Because you can just spend a couple of hours at the controller, do it all once and then you're good to go. But I'll go through how to do that when we're at that stage, once everything's in the ground and we can go through and do a decoder wire up for you guys. So. How many solenoids does a decoder... So this one here can turn on a, a single station. Um, they do a 200, a 400 and a 600, which is a um, two, four, six stations, which is basically one decoder, but it gives you, it's got, more, I guess, the amount of wires. So if it was two stations, you've got four wires, basically, ready to basically wire up two more stations. We tend to st standardise with just single stations because your valve boxes are separate. So we don't want to have to put a two station in and then run a little linking wire underneath because that's just something that can break. So we just basically do single stations in every valve box. It just makes things a lot easier to program. So, um, uh, so these these controllers can uh, they standardise at 99 stations, um, but we can expand from that as well. So we can go up to 275 off the top of my head, um, and then other controllers can still you know the, the new controllers that are coming out are like over 300 odd stations you can put on one controller. Basically, with the pump with the mains as well as a master valve there as well. So when that turns on at the same time, turn station one on. Yep. Now they're having a master valve and then a sensor on the master valve with your flow control and as well, isn't it? Yep. So at, at the water meter, we go into our backflow, which is our, our one-way valve to stop any water coming back that might have had fertilizers and stuff in it. That's the reason that we have that there. Then we go into a master valve, which basically isolates the whole line, depressurizes it. So it's not water. If you if someone hits that main line in the middle of the night and the system's not on, it's not going to shoot water out everywhere because the system's not on, unless it was irrigating. And then if it was irrigating, that's why we have a flow sensor after that. So what the flow sensor is doing is it's reading and it learns. You turn your, your sprinklers on and that's say station one's a sprinkler valve and we know that that sprinkler station, it's learned that it's doing 100 litres a minute, right? That pipe blows out overnight. Now all of a sudden that valve's, that sensor is reading that valve and it's doing 150 litres a minute. It's going to register that and go, oh, something's wrong. It turns that station off moves to the next station. And then if everything's all good, it will then give you a report in the morning or when you go to the controller next that there's an alarm. And it'll tell you that you've had a problem with that station. And you can go, okay, cool, station one had a high flow. I'll turn that on and I'll see if I can see a leak and understand what's going on. If it reads, if it goes to the next valve and it's still got high flow, and then it, it will, it'll, go, it'll shut that valve off and it'll move to the next one. And if it's still got high flow, what it means is it goes, well, now the valves aren't blown, maybe the main line's blown because we've shut all valves off and, we've, and then it will actually say, hang on, we've shut all valves off but we'll leave the master valve on and we're still getting flow. Why are we getting flow when I've only got, I've got no valves on? So it'll go, all right, cool, let's turn the whole system off and it'll shut everything down. And you come back in the morning and you'll, you'll notice because either something will be really wet or the whole site's dry, that should have watered. I'll go to the controller, flow alarms, it's flashing a red light, what's going on? And then it will tell you, okay, we, we know what's happening. Station one reported a high flow. You look at your plan, I know where station one is. Out you go, turn that valve on, okay, we've got a fault. Whereas if you didn't have flow sensors and master valves, you, you don't know where you where that. Look how big these wetlands are, you don't know where you're gonna have those blowouts, unless it's been on all night, in which case it's probably filled the wetland up. So it's, a, it's, it's very, very, in, the, in the, the day and age we're living in with water security and sustainability, um, flow sensors are, are a big part of commercial irrigation. So, yeah. But like I said, I'll go through the programming with you guys when we actually get to it and the lightning protection and grounding and all that sort of stuff as well. All right. Oh, this is awesome to have someone to come out and actually 
Yeah. No, look, I know. Yeah. Like, no, I appreciate just, it, man. It's something that, yeah, you know, just seeing that part and just knowing that from start up to, you know, from then on, it's going to it makes a huge difference, man. Like, yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. No worries. Easy. All done.